So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or on my website at www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from the book, The Crosswords, Crossroads of Should and Must, from L. Luna. When you decide to look for your dreams in real life, where do you go? I felt silly silly scanning the website's apartment rental listings. What would I even type in the search box? I had no idea what I was looking for or what I would find. But the quest became this alluring, playful adventure, like being on a treasure hunt. And one day I found it. Right there on the website in a small photograph not much bigger than a thumbnail the white room. There it was, right there on the computer screen. An apartment for rent in San Francisco. And there was an open house the very next day, of course. An interview between Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell. Mr. Moyers, do you ever have the sense of being helped by hidden hands? Joseph Campbell, all the time. It is miraculous. I even have a superstition that has grown on me as a result of invisible hands coming all the time. Namely, that if you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. When you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in your field of bliss and they open doors to you, I say. Follow your bliss, and don't be afraid, and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. When I arrived at the open house, I was surprised to find a dozen other people viewing the apartment. That was not a part of my dream. But in some inexplicable inexplicable way, I felt that the space was already mine, that it had to be, that just as I was searching for it, it was searching for me. And while I had no idea what I was doing, I knew exactly what I was doing. I gave the agent my rental application and left. Two weeks later, with two suitcases and the dog, I moved into the white room for my dreams. I sat on the concrete floor and looked around. Unexpectedly, I began to panic. What had I done? What was this all about? Why am I here? I said aloud. And the room replied, It's time to paint. The next morning, I began the hardest journey of my life, painting my dream. I hadn't painted in almost ten years, so I went to the art supply store and rebuilt my tool kit. Foam brushes and foam rollers and fan brushes and ink... And as I ran my hands over the wooden brush handles, I recalled my brush-in-hand childhood. That magic wand that transformed forest sticks into brightly colored snakes, rocks into round canvases, paper plates into portraits. I collected memories in the cart as the familiar smell of fibrous papers lured me to the next aisle. Craft and watercolor and cold-pressed cotton papers... I grabbed what I needed and made my way into the colors. 
How quickly I remembered their names, their consistencies, their subtle shifts when mixed with water or gloss, their reactions to mylar and bristol and unprimed canvas. I remembered being 18 years old and leaving my childhood home, gathering my favorite pencils and paints and placing them in that box that we sealed with thin gummy tape. I placed the box into the trunk of the car, waved goodbye, and reversed out of the driveway heading north. At the art supply store, as I heaved a gallon tub of white paint off the shelf and into my cart, I remembered the weight of a similar box in my hands as I carried it up the stairs to my first apartment, my second, the ninth, and tenth. I kept that box next to desks where it remained unopened. I forced it into cabinets so it wouldn't be in the way, and eventually, while I was filling out law school applications, I abandoned it in the basement of an old apartment building next to a faux Christmas tree with pre-strung lights. Stepping into my future, I paid for my art supplies, returned home with my box, and painted with an energy that I'd never felt before. From the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Have you ever spent time in Santa Fe? There's a subculture of healing there. The idea is that there's something therapeutic in the atmosphere, a safe place to go and get yourself together. There are other places. Santa Barbara comes to mind usually populated by upper-middle-class people with more time and money than they know what to do, and in which a culture of healing also obtains. The concept in all these environments seems to be that one needs to complete his healing before he is ready to do his work. This way of thinking, are you ahead of me, is a form of resistance. What are we trying to heal anyway? The athlete knows the day will never come when he wakes up pain-free. He has to play hurt. Remember, the part of us that we imagine needs healing is not the part we can't create from. That part is far deeper and stronger. The part we create from can't be touched by anything our parents did or society did. That part is unsullied, uncorrupted, soundproof, waterproof, and bulletproof proof. In fact, the more troubles we've got, the better and richer that part becomes. The part that needs healing is our personal life. Personal life has nothing to do with work. Besides, what better way of healing than to find our center of self-sovereignty? Isn't that the whole point of healing? I washed up in New York a couple decades ago, making 20 bucks a night, driving a cab and running away full time from doing my work. One night, alone in my $110 a month sublet, I hit bottom in terms of having diverted myself into so many phony channels so many times that I couldn't rationalize, rationalize it for one more evening. I dragged out my ancient Smith Corona, dreading the experience as pointless, fruitless, meaningless, not to say the most painful exercise I could think of. For two hours, I made myself sit there torturing out some trash that I chucked immediately into the shit can. That was enough. I put the machine away. I went back to the kitchen. In the sink sat 10 days of dishes. For some reason, I had enough excess energy that I decided to wash them. The warm water felt very good. The soap and sponge were doing their thing. A pile of clean plates began rising into the drying rack. To my amazement, I realized I was whistling. It hit me that I had turned a corner. I was okay. I would be okay from here on. Do you understand? I hadn't written anything good. It might be years before I would. 
if I ever did at all. That didn't matter. What counted was that I had, after years of running from it, actually sat down and done my work. Don't get me wrong. I've got nothing against true healing. We all need it. But it has nothing to do with doing our work, and it can be an, a colossal exercise in resistance. Resistance loves healing. Resistance knows that the more psychic energy we expend dredging and redredging the tired, boring injustices of our personal lives, the less juice we have to do our work. This is from my journal, Deepen the Way You Live Your Life. What did you know for sure when you were a girl? Oscar Wilde says, Yes, I am a dreamer. For a dreamer is one who can find his way by moonlight and see the dawn before the rest of the world. Some things have been in your heart since you were a little girl. The things you like to do. The stories you love to hear the activities that brought you joy. These inner whispers hold within them the blueprints for more joy in your life. Think about your eight-year-old self and write down those things you knew for sure about yourself back then. What do you see about yourself today through those eyes? Mm 